Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. Let's all stand and sing.
servants, yet they call them master. He had no degree, yet they call them teacher. He had no army, yet rulers feared him. He claimed no territory, yet they called him king. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He defeated all his enemies, yet he harm no one. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. His name is Jesus. And today we're here to celebrate his name and Jesus, what he's done for us. In Matthew 1, when the angel came to visit Joseph, he said, you're to, call him the, you're, you're to call him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's exactly what he did for us. And 
we're here to honor and to celebrate his life, his death, and his resurrection. He's the one who's given us the gift of forgiveness and the, the assurance of eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to thank you for that gift of eternal life, that assurance with you that one day we'll be with you and with Jesus in heaven. We thank you for going to the cross for us, Jesus, and for taking our punishment and for giving us that gift. And as we remember, as we partake of these emblems, may we remember the sacrifice you've given on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you have emblems in front of you. If you'd open those, we'll partake together. <coughs> in remembrance of Jesus. this time we come to remember how good God is to us Amen. how he's blessed us and there is a box in the back you can drop your, your gifts and offerings in later let's pray dear heavenly father again we come thanking you for just how good you are to us and how wonderful and how much you bless us Lord and we want to return a portion of that and, and honor you Lord we pray that these gifts would be pleasing to you and we ask Lord that this this money these these talents that we give back and the, and the time um, that they would honor you Lord and that they would glorify your name in Jesus name Amen, amen. Well, December is here, and uh, I don't know about you, but December always seems like the fastest month of the year. It just seems to go by very quickly, and uh, three weeks from today will be Christmas, and uh, there's a lot going on with families and work and school and church and different friends and things like that, but we want you to realize that uh, it's so important for us to uh, make time to worship God and to spend time with God as we do all year long. We especially need that during this time of year. And if you look in your bulletin, you can see what's happening at church as far as Christmas services. And we're going to get into some uh, Christmas messages next week. But this week, we're going to finish up one more uh, series, one more sermon on prayer, uh, as we've been studying that over the past 11 weeks. And uh, maybe you remember the days, maybe you were the one on the bicycle, maybe you were the one holding the bicycle. You remember that time when maybe you rode a bicycle for the very first time, no training wheels, mom and dad weren't helping you out, they kind of guide you along and then they let you go and you go off on your own? Well, I kind of feel that that's where we are right now as far as this study on prayer. We've been uh, learning from Michael DeFazio in small groups, we've been talking about here, uh, talking about prayer at church as well, and I feel like now's the time for us to start riding on our own. We need to start implementing some of these things we've learned into our prayer life and uh, it's time for us to no longer have uh, somebody holding us up. It's time for us to pedal on our own and to pray uh, on our own and to pray together. 
and it's time to take everything that we've learned and put it into practice. So one more message on prayer, and hopefully this is a, a, good, a good passage for us to think about as Christmas approaches. We're going to look at the church in the book of Acts, Christians just like us praying together, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, so if you want to turn there, pull that up, uh, I would encourage you to do that as we look at how the church was praying together and how they set an example for us. We'll start in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, where we read this story. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now there, there's so much detail in every verse of scripture. Peter and John, obviously the two great, two of the great apostles of Jesus Christ, and uh, they would go to the temple to pray because they didn't have a church building like we did. The early church would meet either in people's homes, a small group of people might meet in a home, but if they were going to meet in a large assembly, they would go to the temple where there were porches and different places where they could pray. And we also read in verse 1 that this was taking place at 3 in the afternoon. And we've heard the stories about how the Jewish people would pray at 9 a.m. and then at noon and then at 3 p.m. And that's really why we see so many great stories occurring in the book of Acts at those three times. 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. So here are Peter and John going to the temple at the time of prayer. And at the temple, there's a man who is a beggar. He's crippled and lame since birth. And we will find out later on that he has been in this condition for 40 years. He has been in this uh, condition since birth. There's really, there hasn't been any improvement for him during his whole life. He was born lame and crippled, and he's still in this condition today. He's basically broken physically and monetarily. He probably doesn't have any money. And I would imagine... He's probably been sitting at these uh, at this temple gate for half of his life. You know, his parents cared for him as long as they could, but now he relies on the care of others. He he is carried every day to the temple gate called Beautiful. Figure that he couldn't have a wheelchair, probably didn't have a wheelchair to get him around where he needed to go. So he was always relying on the help of other people. And he asked Peter and John for money. Now maybe he recognized Peter and John they were regulars at the temple. Maybe he had seen Jesus at the temple in the past. That's hard to say. But we're going to pay attention to what Peter and John tell this man who is begging at the gate. Verse 6. Here's Peter's response. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. So this man says, hey, do you have any money? And Peter's like, no, I don't have any money, but I can give you something better than that. I can give you a miracle. I'm not going to give you a handout, but God will give you healing. And Peter takes him by the right hand, basically pulls him up. I mean, did this crippled man think he was going to stand on this day? No. Did he ask for healing? Did he ask for a miracle? He did not. He just needed a little bit of money. That's what he wanted, just a little bit of money to get him through that day. So Peter takes him by the right hand, pulls him up. He has never stood on his feet before. But you know what he's doing now? He's standing. He's not just standing. He's walking. He jumped up. He's walking and leaping and praising God. And uh, we need to remember that if we're going to help people, and this is a good season to help people, the season of Christmas. It's a season of giving. If we're going to help people, it's going to require some effort. It's going to require some work. We might have to pull them up out of the situation where they're in. We might have to reach out and get our hands dirty to help those people get back on their feet and get right with God. Peter helped him up and he was healed instantly. And if you think about this for a minute, what happens to muscles year after year when you don't use them. What happens to those muscles? What's it called? Atrophy. Atrophy. So this man is healed. He is able to walk. There's no atrophy. He doesn't have to stretch out. He doesn't have to go through rehab. In fact, when you hurt a muscle, what do they call those people who help you build up your strength again? 
Physical terrorists. That's right. That's what they're called. <laughs> and um, thank you. Thank you for your help. Uh, but listen to uh, listen to Luke's medical report in verse seven. Luke is a doctor, and he says, you know, he helped them up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He had never done this before. He jumped up on his feet. He was lame from birth. He was more than forty years old, but now he's he jumps up to his feet. He's walking and leaping. This crippled man is praising God. The crowd is amazed. And Peter and John have been used by Jesus Christ in a mighty way. And everybody's happy except the religious leaders. They're not happy about it. In fact, everybody's following Peter and John. Peter and John are talking about Jesus, the name of Jesus. They said, this man has been healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, we are baptized in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is powerful because of his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. And they said, by what power or name do you do this? Who gives you the right to do this? And they, they're going to say the same thing all throughout the book of Acts. From this day forward, they will say, it's by the name of Jesus. And the religious leaders know that they're in trouble. See, they thought, if we get rid of Jesus, that will solve the problem. But it didn't solve the problem. It just, this is not the right way to say it. Uh, it didn't make the problem worse, but it, it allowed Jesus' name to spread all across the world. That's what happened after uh, Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection. They wanted to tell everybody all about Jesus. So the religious leaders say, you know what? We're going to tell the apostles that they're not allowed to talk about Jesus anymore. <clears throat> We're going to tell them by our authority they, they should no longer use the name of Jesus. And that's what they're going to say in verse 18. I wanted you to hear the miracle because it all ties into what's going on in Acts chapter 4, verse 18. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. Here's what the religious leaders do. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, could you imagine if the apostles had if the apostles had listened to them? We don't want you to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Do you know where we would be right now? Do you know where you and I would be right now? We wouldn't be here. We'd be very lost, hopelessly lost. But they didn't listen. Peter and John said, you're telling us to be silent. God has told us we have to speak. And this is a season when, when we should speak. When we should tell people and love people and encourage people. That all the lights and the Christmas trees and the gifts, all the love points back to one person, Jesus Christ. I would pray that we have the attitude of Peter and John in verse 20. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is the season to speak up about what we've seen and heard, what God has done in your life. Now here's the part where we where we move into their prayer. Verse 23. They're going to teach us some great lessons about prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Peter and John are going to go back to their people, to the other apostles, the other people in the Jerusalem church, and they're going to meet together and pray together. That's one of the interesting things that happens when we have problems. Problems either draw us closer together or they drive us further apart. That works with the church. That works in our relationship with God. When you're having problems in life, does it draw you closer to God or does it drive you away? And, and don't blame the problem. It's a decision that we make. We choose to draw closer to God. We choose to draw closer to the church. We can choose to draw closer to other people. Or we can step back. I mean, I remember being in high school, 
or maybe just out of high school and um, talking to some folks from our church who hadn't been there in a while. And I asked this gentleman, I said, uh, you doing okay? You know, we haven't seen you at church for a while. And they said, you know, things have just been really tough. So we haven't been there. And being young and naive, I thought, well, if things are tough, you would think that's where you need to be. That's where you should be. When Peter and John faced this persecution, they didn't run away. They didn't hide. They didn't withdraw. They drew closer together with the church. And they prayed. And they didn't pray because... It was just something to do. I want you to realize that prayer was such an important habit of the early church. In Acts chapter 4, verse 24, here's the prayer that they pray together. Or here's the beginning of the prayer they pray together. Acts 4, 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Just in case you needed a reminder that when you pray... Your voice is heard by God. When you pray, your voice matters to God. And when you pray, your prayers are answered by God. And that's the truth. Prayer was not just a reaction that they had for the trouble they were going through. It was their habit. This is what they did all the time. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And basically, before we really get into their prayer... I just want to lay out four verses that show you how important prayer was in the early church. And if it was important to them, it should be important to us. That's, that's what I would say. They, were, they prayed all the time. They were very devoted and committed to prayer. So let's just look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. That's the first verse you would find as you go through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer. And when they started out, there were only 120 people in Jerusalem who were the followers of Jesus. 120 people. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't half a million or in the thousands. When they started, there was only 120 people. They joined together constantly in prayer. This is what they were doing all the time. This was a regular habit. This was a consistent practice among the early church. They joined together constantly in prayer. Have you ever thought about what they were praying for? I know what they, well, I shouldn't say I know, but I have a good idea of what they were praying for. They were praying for this. They were praying, how is God going to help us get the message of Jesus to Volusia County? <laughs> now, were they thinking exactly of us? No. But they were thinking about, how are we going to get the message of Jesus all around the world? That was their prayer. That was their job. That was their mission. That's why they were praying all the time. In fact, they were joining together constantly in prayer in Acts chapter 1. And what happens in Acts chapter 2? That's when we see the beginning of the church. What did they go out and do? They were beginning to teach in Jesus' name. And they were baptizing people in Jesus' name. 3,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus. The church was born after this prayer meeting. Acts chapter 1 verse 14 says they... They all joined together constantly in prayer. And then in Acts 2.42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. This was a regular, consistent part of their meeting together, to pray for one another, to pray about taking the message of Jesus Christ further than it had ever been before. They were devoted to prayer. And one more verse, Acts chapter 12, verse 5. The church was earnestly praying to God. The church was earnestly praying to God. When I put all those verses together, in my mind, I just think they had such great commitment to prayer. I would hope and pray that we are having, that we have the same kind of commitment to prayer in our church. The church was earnestly praying to God. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. They joined together constantly in prayer. They were devoted to prayer. The church was earnestly praying to God. Their example is amazing. It's amazing. Now let's actually hear what they prayed. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. It says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. 
What did they call God in their prayer? Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. The first part of every prayer that we pray, you know this, but sometimes we just need to be reminded of this. The first part of every prayer that we pray is that we address God. We address God, right? When you pray to God, what do you do? Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, dear Lord. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, this then is how you should pray. What were the first two words of that prayer? Our Father. Our Father, Matthew chapter 6. This then is how you should pray, our Father. When it was Jesus' turn to pray in the garden, what did he call God? He cried out, Abba, Father. Same thing. Our Father, Abba, Father. Here the church is praying to the sovereign Lord. That's the first thing we do every time we pray. We address God. We've talked about that in small groups. We address God when we begin our prayer. Sovereign Lord. When they call him Sovereign Lord, they're saying, Lord, we know that you are the highest power, that you are the absolute authority, that you are in complete control. We also need to be reminded that every time we pray, even if it's something simple like praying over a meal, Every time we pray, we are admitting that we are surrendering to God. We are surrendering to God. Every prayer is a prayer of surrender. So they start out by saying, Sovereign Lord, God is in control of everything. God is in control of everything. Then they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So what does that mean? That God is what? Creator. creator. That God is the creator. Creator. That everything exists, everything that exists has been created by God. And the book of Romans talks about this. Romans chapter 1, it's a very powerful chapter. And it reminds us that the creator is way more powerful than the creation. The creator is far more powerful than the creation. A good reminder for us. The creator is far more powerful than the creation. So they start off this prayer by addressing God. Sovereign Lord, they call him the creator. What about verse 25? Verses 25 and 26. Here's their prayer. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So here they are praying to God and one of the things that Michael DeFazio taught us in small group videos is that we address God and then we align, we have to align ourselves with God. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because when we pray those words, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. What are we saying? We're saying, God, we want to align our lives with your will. We want to get our lives in alignment with your will. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here they are aligning themselves with what God wants. Verse 25, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of, our, of your servant, our father David. So what are they talking about? What do they mean here? They're talking about that David spoke the words of God. There's only one part of one book of the Bible that David wrote and those the, the part of the book of the Bible the part of the Bible that David wrote comes from the book of Psalms comes from the book of Psalms so that's what they're talking about here they're talking about how David wrote these Psalms for God to God God helped him write these Psalms so in this part of their prayer they're talking about God we need to remember that you are the author of the word you are the author of the Bible. You are the author of Scripture. And when they start quoting David, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They're quoting David from the book of Psalms. It's actually Psalm 2, the second Psalm. And what they're doing here is they're praying a psalm. Now that's something that we learned about in small groups as well. Open up to one of the psalms and read it and pray it. There's so much you can pray in every psalm, every verse. There's so much good content to pray over and pray for in the psalms. And 
Remember, what has just happened to the apostles? They've been dealing with the religious leaders who told them, we don't want you to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they say, Lord, you're a sovereign Lord. You're more powerful than they are. You are the creator, and uh, you, you are eternal. And you also gave us the word. And when you read this psalm, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Those verses, you, you can keep those verses in mind every time you watch the news. Because that, that's the problem with the world. Amen. Fighting against God. Fighting against God. In fact, that last part of the verse, they're fighting against the Lord, God, and his anointed one. Who's the anointed one of God? That's Jesus. So if we think, oh, this war against God, you know, it's the new thing. David wrote it 3,000 years ago. The world hasn't changed. It's the same battle. Are you going to fight against God or are you going to follow God? The apostles say, you know what, Lord, the power is not found in Rome or Herod or Pilate or the religious leaders. You are the sovereign Lord. You are the creator. You're the one who has given us your word. And uh, they're going to do everything in their power to preach the name of Jesus. Verse 29, their prayer continues. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Something, the next part of the lesson that we learned in small groups, that we address God, sovereign Lord, our Father. We align ourselves with God's will. That's what they were doing here as they quoted the Psalms. That's what Jesus told us to do when we should pray, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. We address God. We align ourselves with God. Then we ask for what we need. We ask for what we need. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation. That's when we ask. Here, what are they asking for? They're asking for boldness in verse 29. Now, Lord, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Very interesting. They didn't pray, Lord, remove those leaders and put better leaders in their place. They didn't pray that. They didn't pray, Lord, help us to get revenge against these religious leaders. They didn't pray for that either. They prayed, they didn't even pray for protection. They said, Lord, we don't want to go through this again. We don't want to go through a trial. We don't want to be held in jail overnight. They didn't even pray for protection. You know what they prayed for? Boldness to speak. They prayed for the boldness to speak. Enable your servants to speak your word. The apostles, the, the church was saying, Lord, the commission that you gave us is far greater than our comfort. Lord, we believe that Following you is a life of commitment and not a life of convenience. Lord, we believe that we are here for a mission and not just to maintain until you come back. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. If they prayed for boldness, don't you think we should be praying for boldness too? Maybe that should be your prayer this month. God, enable me to speak with great boldness. Maybe that's the prayer you should pray between now and Christmas. Because God wants to speak through you. He wants to speak through all of us. They prayed, now, Lord, verse 29, consider their threats and, and, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Verse 30, they said, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Their request was, God, give us the boldness to speak. But then they made a request that God would perform signs and wonders 
miracles through them, through the apostles. I mean, they just did a miracle, right? Peter healed the man, took him by the hand, helped him stand up. He's been lame since birth, 40 years. His ankles became strong, instantly became strong, and he stood up on his feet, jumped up on his feet, and he was walking and leaping and praising God. And sometimes we think, you know what? If we could do miracles like that, we would have far more people in church. You know, more people would believe. Now I want you to think about this. We talked about this in our small group this past Thursday night. Jesus was perfect, right, in every way. Wasn't he? Yeah. Two people agree that Jesus was perfect. <laughs> Jesus was perfect in every way. Yeah. Yes. Never sinned. Never sinned. He's the greatest teacher who ever lived. Amen. He's the greatest miracle worker who ever lived. Did everybody believe in him? Did everybody no. follow him? No. no. I mean, part of the reason why they crucified him is because they couldn't stand his message. They couldn't stand his miracles. Yeah. And they didn't want to deal with him anymore. <laughs> so to think that, oh, if we could just you know, heal a crippled person like Peter and John, and it's going to uh, make everything easier. It doesn't work that way. They healed this man. Peter and John healed him in the name of Jesus. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. That ended up, they landed in jail because of that. So they're asking God to do signs, but signs and miracles and wonders don't bring everybody to Jesus. Did, Jesus didn't even pull that off. And he was perfect. So we need to remember that we need to pray for that boldness in verse 29. Dear God, help us to be bold as Christmas approaches. But their prayer was, Lord, we're going to speak. That's what we can do. And what you can do, Lord, is you can send those signs and wonders to draw people to Jesus. Verse 31. This is a good verse. It's It's what happens after the prayer after they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly that's what they asked for they asked for boldness and they spoke the word of God boldly uh, the fact that the place was shaken I mean the, the place was shaken there was an earthquake um, you know this was something that God did I mean, that's pretty good. I think that would be pretty cool. But I think what's even better is the fact that they spoke the word of God boldly. That was their request. That's what they asked for. Sovereign Lord, enable us to speak with boldness. And they did exactly what they what they asked God. They asked God for boldness, and they went out and spoke boldly. They kept their part of the prayer. And what we need to remember is that God has already done the shaking. God has already done the shaking. The, the place was shaken in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. So if the place, God is, if God has already done the shaking, you know what we need to do? We need to start speaking. We need to start speaking. And if you don't feel like you can, pray their prayer. Enable your servants to speak the word with great boldness. I think there is some shaking that needs to occur. I think God sometimes, well, not sometimes, I think God needs to uh, shake us out of our complacency. God needs to shake us out of our comfort. He needs to shake us out of this building because the people that need Jesus are out there. And this is the season and this is the time when they're probably looking for him more than any other time. God has already done the shaking. Just like this church in Acts chapter 4, we need to keep on praying. And it's time to start speaking. This is the time to start speaking. This is the time to pray for boldness and to tell people that Jesus loves them. We're going to sing an invitation song, and it's an opportunity for anybody to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ because you're not saved by the name of the church, you're saved only by the name of Jesus. And it's the name of Jesus. Jesus that we believe in. It's the name of Jesus that we confess. It's the name of Jesus that we're baptized in. It's his name that forgives us and saves us. And uh, we're going to sing a song, and the, the first line of the song might surprise you, because it's a reminder to us that Jesus came to save us while we were unfaithful to him. But even though we were unfaithful to him, he still came into this world to save us. 
So we're going to stand and sing together, O come all you unfaithful. Let's stand together and sing that song. So Joan has kept up uh, her end of the bargain. Uh, Joan is a believer in Jesus. You can applaud for Miss Joan. Miss Joan is a believer in Jesus. Wow. 
us to be part of 